Hello, everybody. I just need to put my um. <clears throat> Second mic on, which I completely forgot about. It'll take me a second. Because <clears throat> I have one mic here, which is my kind of high quality mic for when I'm facing this way in painting, and another one, which is this one I can walk around with, which I haven't turned on yet. Okay. Hopefully, <clears throat> both mics should be working now. Looks kind of all right to me. Hello and welcome to <clears throat> the live stream for, where's the date? It's the 5th of November. I should, I should totally know. I've been lost in technology for the last two days because an integral part of my setup failed the other day so I've had to find um, another way to to set things up and get things moving again and I think it may actually be it looks like it's working fine for me and I think it may actually have been a good thing because I think I found a better way to do things now um, <clears throat> or a little bit more flexible so do let me know, please, if you're watching on YouTube or on Facebook in the comments. Just leave me a comment. Let me know if you can hear me and if you can see me. Okay. Looks to me like we're all right. Um, so today is the second session on some apples from my friend's traditional English orchard farm in Gloucestershire. Um, here is the subject. Here is the painting. Um, and I also have posted on Facebook. So if you follow me on Facebook, I've posted the picture. So if you wanted to have a go at painting this, feel free. I always put, I took a photo of the subject. Obviously I'm painting it from life, but I take a photo of the subject and I think I've learned enough about photography now to get really quite close to how the subject really looks. And as far as I'm concerned, those photos are free copyright free for anybody to use in their work. I'm fine with that. We all interpret um, the reference material, whether it's from life or from uh, a photograph in a different way. So um, <clears throat> I don't mind if you use it. At the moment, we have a really beautiful day, but the light is gonna go quite soon. So I've got a backup light today. When the light fails, I can keep streaming and that's probably gonna happen in about an hour or so. We'll see how we go. Um, three, I've got three paintings I'm working on simultaneously at the moment, all kind of autumn themed, a pair of quinces that I started a little while ago, some autumn leaves, and then this one with the apples. Let me, um, I'll just try switching over to a different view so you can see better. Hello, Linda. Hi, Christopher, good to see you. Thank you, Sharon, that's great to hear. Um, so here is, uh, mm, this is an interesting setup. So, so this is what I mean about being able to set things up slightly differently, so. Hello, Daniel, hi, Beth. <laughs> it is a strange time indeed, um, Satan's art. I'm well, thank you. Denise, really good to see you. It's always lovely to see you here too. Uh, yeah, it's beautiful, Christopher, outside today. It is indeed. Hello, Vida. Really nice to see you. Okay, so look. <clears throat> Hopefully you can see this. Um, this is a new... I'm trying a new setup today. So there's a little bit of me kind of trying to figure this out as I go. Little bit of trial and error, perhaps, today. But you should hopefully be able to see now four different views. This one, hi, um, <clears throat> the palette. Now the subject on the, on the right is a photo I took. You're very welcome, Mayor. I think we all need that at the moment, huh? Um, I'm not gonna be talking about the US election at all today. We're gonna find out for sure 
um, in the next day or two. So this bit of space right here with this stream is about painting and that's all, um, <clears throat> at least from my end. So here's the painting, here's the palette. And here is, which I can't point to, is the subject. <clears throat> Do I use a wooden palette? No, I don't use a wooden palette. This, my palette is, um, this is actually plexiglass, some kind of plastic over a neutral gray backing. And I prefer to mix my colors on a neutral gray because then it's much easier to see the colors they are. Michelle, really good to see you. How are you doing? And how are you watercoloring today? Have you got your watercolors out? Let's, I, I would be really, really interested. I was thinking about you actually on Tuesday, Michelle. I would be really interested to see what you made of this subject. Um, I was looking at these very, very intense reds here that I haven't quite, I think perhaps haven't quite got to yet. Um, <clears throat> which I'm going to be trying to to reach today. I mean, really, the, the reds on this apple are so intense. Yeah, Michelle, if you're setting up, um, if you're setting up uh, still lives in artificial light, I've found the key is a diffuser on the light. It helps the, it helps soften all of the shadow shapes and the edges of the shadows. This is just linseed oil, by the way, I'm putting out. Um, otherwise you get very hard edged shadows and you get very um, extreme value, uh, very extreme changes in the value blocks. Whereas if you have a diffuser, like if you can see a little bit like this light is, um, it's a, a Niwa LED, um, dimmable. Um, <clears throat> it's very high CRI as LEDs usually are. It has a, this box here, I'll show you it, is a diffuser that fits over the light. So it softens the shadow. I really shouldn't have done that. I'll never get it back in the same position now. <laughs> so it softens the, the shadows, you know, so you get you get something that's much closer approaches than I can. Daylight. So I've been on the hunt for, um, yeah, I bet. Extreme value is very hard to paint in watercolor. Honestly, I don't know how you paint in watercolor at all. I really don't. So this, I've, I've been on a, a journey of some years to get as close as I can to natural daylight, especially so I can paint through the winter and so I can paint in the evenings and stream in the evenings too, because I teach mostly in the evenings when I teach online. Evening's my time. Um, and these are the best I've found so far. It's a big bank of LEDs, it's dimmable. You can change the temperature um, and it comes with a diffuser. The only downside is when you put the diffuser on, you can't angle the light up or down. Apart from that, it's perfect. Let's try, let me to show you what I've got on the palette, okay, today. I'll take you through it quickly. My mind's gone blank. Lead white, sorry. <laughs> My mind went blank, because there was something I was trying to remember. And what I was trying to remember was why I put this oil out, and it's to mix a little bit with this lead white. Now this lead white, comes from Rublev and it's gorgeous, but it tends to separate a bit in the tube. And when you get further down the tube, a lot of the oil has already squirted out, I find. So when I put it out on the palette, I add a little bit of oil to get it back to that stringy, ropey kind of consistency. And you can get it like exactly how you want it. And so that's lead white. I have that there because I'm on the second session of the painting and um, it's mostly the handling properties. Titanium white. This is a very green yellow. The pigment is PY3. It's Michael Harding bright yellow lake. This is Cranfield, another British maker, very similar to Michael Harding, cad yellow. This is yellow ochre, Michael Harding green gold. And this is the highest blue, highest chroma blue red I have. And it is, where is it, where is it? Williamsburg Pyrrole Red. Now I actually have two of these. I've got two to test them out. This one is from Langridge. They're the same pigment, um, PR254, I think. Let me check. Yeah, PR254. But this one is, the Langridge is slightly bluer and slightly lower chroma. And this is slightly more orange and slightly higher chroma. They're both good though. 
quinacridone rose if I want a very blue red. Probably won't be using that today. Um, <clears throat> don't know why I put it out. Transparent red oxide, Michael Harding. My favourite colour in the world, raw umber, which I use almost as much as white. Ivory black, which I would use for my greens and dropping chroma here and there. And um, this is Windsor & Newton Windsor Green Yellow Shade. It's a thallo green. And because I'm on my second session, I'm also going to want a little bit of medium and I'm going to use this. Oleo gel, Rublev Oleo gel. Put a bit of that out. I need to get some more of this. This is so old now. I have to dig down to the bottom to find any that's still all right. Come on, there must be some good stuff in there somewhere. There we go. So I'm going to put on a really, really thin layer of this. I'll talk in a minute about the state this painting is in now and what bits I'm going to treat how in order to carry on moving on. Um, but before I do, I want to say a little bit about, um, actually this camera is a bit overexposed, let me change that. Is it overexposed? A little bit. That should be better. I want to talk a little bit about what I want to change in this painting. So I've had a couple of days to think about this, where it is now and what I might want to do with it. And. Um, Overall, I would say uh, I'm fairly happy with it overall. I need to finish the leaves, obviously, and perhaps some stuff around here. But I, I want to make it look more natural, so I want to drop the chroma around here. I probably want to drop the value here because this is very light at the moment. I'm probably going to drop the chroma in these leaves because the chroma is a little too high. But I'm going to, I want to bring the chroma up in the red. Okay. So what I'm looking to do is to make the whole thing overall look more natural by dropping the chroma a little bit. But to make this really kind of um, stand out. Hello Sanjita, nice to see you. Okay, so I'm going to start. So that the state this painting is in at the moment, this is all dry. I painted the first layer into a, a couch, a thin layer of mixed solvent and linseed oil. Turpentine and linseed oil mixed together. Very thin layer. I painted it on, wiped it off and then painted into that. So this is all dry. But where this was painted with titanium white, so that is still wet. This here, still wet. So I can paint directly over this with paint. Around here, the shadow areas. By the time I get down here, it's dry. This is still a little bit wet. This is dry. That's drying. That's dry. So I can put a couch on areas that are dry, that are touch dry, but I can't put it anywhere else because I'm just going to smear, smear the colour. So I'm just going to get a little bit on my finger. Really, really thin. I want as little as possible, but I want to be painting wet into wet. I don't want to be painting. on a dry surface. I'm probably going to destroy this edge a little bit because I want to go right up to this edge with, with my thin layer of, this is the oleo gel I'm rubbing on now. And it means that when I start to paint over it again, these areas, I will effectively be painting wet into wet. So it feels like it did, it will feel like it did on the first session. As close as I can get. You never quite get the same kind of fluidity I find on, uh, oh, see that, I lifted it a bit, that was still wet there. Here is dry. The main thing I want is, I don't want any dry areas. That's all right. I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna do a little bit on this shadow, probably. So I'll rub a little bit in there as well. Uh, yeah, it's actually not, not a glass cut. You can get those in glass. It's very similar to a glass palette. Glass is actually better, Liz. Glass is better. Is oleo gel alkyd? Uh, no, it doesn't. It's, it, no, it doesn't contain any alkyd. O oleo gel is heat bodied oil. So it's linseed oil, primarily, which has been 
heated. So it started to po polymerize, which turns it into a gel. And then it has some um, fumed silica added, a little bit of ground glass, which I imagine also helps it, um, its consistency. And it's really, really nice with, with oil paint. I don't know how, uh, I, don't, I can't imagine that it's oil, so you couldn't use it with watercolor for sure. But it's basically, I like to keep things, I like to keep like as few ingredients on here as I possibly can, you know. Let me change. Do you want to be able to see me painting on, or, or is it better like, like I can have it like, like this. So you can just see like close up of the painting. Subject in the palette. This is how I normally stream. Or I can even show you. This is what I've been playing around with. I think I can show you just the palette. <laughs> so there you can see the colours a bit more clearly. But let's stay with this one for now. Um, have I ever used Rublev oil paint? JD Curse asks me. No, I haven't. No, I haven't. I'm very, mostly because I'm very happy with Michael Harding and Cranfield. Um, <clears throat> But, I, uh, and I'm not, I, I find, um, uh, how can I say this? Like, if, if you followed me at all before, you will know that I generally, I'm, I'm a, a Munselite when it comes to painting. Sometimes I paint very, very carefully uh, using the chips and other times like this painting here, um, and also the autumn leaves one that I had earlier on is, but this is this the color for this one to mix completely on the fly, partly because I think it's not good to stick with the same process all the time. You know, this is art at the end of the day, and I want to be open to possibilities. Um, but and also because as I've been working with the Munsell um, book and chips for about ten years now, and it's taught me. Uh, a huge amount about colour to the point where I now have a mental map of the colour space that I can reach with paint. You know, I know what colours I can mix with these. I know what the limits of my values and my, my chroma and my hues are with these paints. And that means that when I come to paint, it's much easier for me to paint on the fly and, and make, hopefully, we hope, less mistakes. Okay, so I'm going to get a little bit of... This is a Cornelis and Hogg brush, by the way. Beautiful brushes. A little bit of oleo gel on this just to work it in. And I'm gonna, the first thing I wanna do is I don't really wanna drop the value so much here, but I do wanna drop the chroma. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start by mixing up an ivory black with raw umber, very small amount of titanium white. And this is going to give me a very low value, more neutral. So I haven't, I'm not really approaching this with any preconceived process. I just find that looking at this painting now, I, I, I probably worked on it for about an hour and a half, maybe two hours on Tuesday. And I've, it's come out, I mean, I like it. I like it, but it's come out a little bit too, there's too much chrome and it looks slightly unnatural to me. Um, so I'm just thinking about, I want to try some things to drop the chroma. Um, I want it to go more green. Too much more black. Not really, I'm, I'm not really, Decided about where it's going to go. But I'm just going to overlay this <clears throat> to, uh, to see how it comes out. And it's particularly nice because I can show this kind of extra bit of chroma here in this leaf where it's in shadow. I mean, this leaf here was painted in like about four strokes, really. So I want to do a bit more on that. Already I'm feeling happier. I'm going to bring in a little more raw umber and some black, just for where it comes close to the apple, because I really want to bring out this, that punchy change here. Like, you know, the strongest part of this painting is, is this edge, the bright edge of this apple. 
it's like this is where the focus is, you know, so I really want that to show. Bring some more black in there. So you can still see a bit of the background underneath. And I'm not looking for like per perfection in terms of how it looks. In fact, that's my enemy. I, I don't want it to look perfect. I want uh, texture. So I'm pushing the hue away from orange slightly towards green and I'm dropping the chroma. I'm going to try it and dropping it even further than that. Yeah, and I'm going to drop it out here as well. Now that's a bit unfortunate because I'm I'm lifting some paint here and not lifting the rest. So I'm just going to have to wait and see what happens. I may need to fix that bit later, or perhaps just paint a little bit more thickly. But the thing about thick paint in the background is like it loses the it loses the texture. But I'm I'm immediately I'm liking this more overall with lower chroma back here. I just think that. This, the original background was, it was mostly, um, I probably shouldn't be working on this part of the painting because it is lifting the paint a little. But it was, it was transparent red oxide with um, raw umber, the original background, and I, it just was too brown and just too much chroma. By the time I get back here, it's dry so I can modulate it more easily. Now to me, um, the apples are starting to stand out a little bit more now that that chroma has dropped. I wonder if I maybe don't need the value that low there. What about if I brought that value up a little? Yeah. And the more I put on of this scumble, glaze, whatever you want to call it, the more I put on, the more the chroma drops. Um, it looks to me a little bit more refined now than it did. It looks less overdone. into those areas a little bit and then leave them and come back to them later. I'm going to need to leave this to dry a little. Probably would have thinking about it if I'd have used um, say lead white instead of titanium back there it would have dried much more quickly which would have made the whole of the background easier to work on today. It's not bothering me particularly though. I say I don't, I, I like to have a bit of texture in there, I don't mind. <clears throat> the, the worst thing I find is if it gets to a point where there's, there's no texture at all and it's all been, I mean, it, it's an aesthetic choice at the end of the day. And I think probably the value will come up a bit back here when I get to this bit. Let's just put some notes in to see. Yeah, bring the value up at the back there for sure. Um, this is nice at this point. It's like, you know, as soon as you're, you're up and you're running and doing something, it starts to feel. You can make him some progress. Um, I'm thinking about dropping the value a little bit round here because ooh. I 
that's actually quite nice. So I'm, what I'm after doing at the beginning is like big changes and then I can think about other things that might, I might want to change. <laughs> Penny says, how did artists like Rembrandt and Caravaggio manage to paint without having the modern lights we have access to? <laughs> um, well, I think, for, I mean, for Caravaggio, he would have had more light anyway because he was in Italy, right? But, um, I mean, Rembrandt was a northern painter. But they used to, apparently, in, in, um, in the Netherlands, in Rembrandt's day, they used to, generally artists would try to, to have their studios on um, streets that ran east to west so that they would have north light. Is where the north light things, thing comes from. They would have north light on one side of the house and they would just paint by natural light. I, they, they, I don't think Rembrandt was uh, streaming live in the winter, so he, to people who are in a different time zone. <laughs> so uh, he, he didn't have to, he didn't have to worry. But you know, it's an interesting point because I mean, we have so much stuff available now. That was lead white, by the way, I was putting on there. And we have, you know, I mean, look at this. I'm streaming live and I can reach, I don't know however many people are gonna be watching this, like a few hundred usually right across the world, astounding. I've got a light on even though the light is fading so I can keep working. And if my apples died, I've got a photograph of them, which I can put up on a, on a screen, you know. And, um, you know, like when I was painting flowers over the summer, a lot of the time, Let's do that. I'm going to do this area with lead as well. When I was painting apples a lot over the, uh, sorry, flowers a lot over the summer, quite often they would, they would die by the second day and I would finish them if I didn't get the painting done in a day. Finish them with, um, from the photo simply not available to artists previously. And uh, there's a lot of stuff talked about photos. And to be honest with you, for a long time, I was dead against working from photos. I came back to painting like about 15 years ago, maybe a little bit longer after a really long gap, you know, I'd always wanted to be a painter. And then I lost my way a little bit <clears throat> and um, lost my way a lot actually and then came back to it again I had a moment of um, revelation really in uh, yeah bring down bring down the value I think just to try it in Venice and I saw a um, painting by Tiepolo Giambattista Tiepolo is one of the great Venetian decorative painters, like huge wall paintings. And there was an enormous ceiling painting. And um, I, I had, for a long time after I was thrown out of art college, and there's another story I won't go into, but um, for a long time, I made a living by copying old masters on the streets in chalk. You know, so I learned a lot copying Da Vinci and um, Giordano and, uh, you know, the well-known painters mostly. And then I discovered, at some point I discovered, um, I'm gonna cut into this. I discovered Tiepolo, fell in love and spent 
quite a long time copying his paintings, like really quite big, like 12 feet by 12 feet in, in pastels on the streets. And, um, and then I went to Venice, oh, my wife persuaded me to take a holiday, went to Venice and uh, walked into this church, Scuola, a Scuola, just off the high street, nothing, you know, you didn't have to pay to go in there, it was just, it was a church, it was a working church. And looked up, <clears throat> and there was one of the Tiepolo paintings which I had copied. I knew every inch of this painting because I'd copied it multiple times. I mean every inch, every little nuance. And I sat down and cried because I wasn't painting at all at the time. I'd completely stopped painting. And um, it just hit me that I was, actually I was working in online marketing, though, so I learned some useful skills then, but it hit me like a train. I was wasting my life and I always wanted to be a painter, so why was I doing this? Why was I messing about doing this? So as soon as I came home, I actually bought a sketchbook while we were on the holiday. And then as soon as I came home, started practicing in earnest and trying to learn. I mean, this was like 15 years ago, probably a bit more now. There wasn't much in the way of online resources then. I'm really liking where this is going. <clears throat> I don't mean my story, I mean the painting. So, you know, I, I just picked up what I could, where I could. I, f I found Julian Merrow Smith and I saw his beautiful work and I followed him. Um, I came across the Barg book in Graydon Parish, introduced me to Monsell and Working Sight Size. That was a huge contribution. Um, and bit by bit, I learned it was tortuous and it was slow. But I got to a point where eventually I'd learned enough that I, I was starting to make work that I didn't hate. <laughs> but it took a very long time. I can't remember how I started this story now. That's how I got back to painting again. Yeah, I had too much chroma in this painting. It was, it felt flash to me and I don't, it's not really me, you know. Um, for a painter who's, uh, there are lots of painters who paint in, I don't mean flash in, in, in a derogatory sense. I mean, um, I don't know how to describe it. I, I like a more quiet aesthetic, you could say. more quiet and restful and, and more naturalistic, I suppose. Um, a lot of painters these days punch up the chroma a lot and do very um, expressive brush strokes, like right across, they'll just take a brush, like a big, um, like say a, an eclipse coma like this, while this is wet and just pull it across, put it right across there, you know. Um, I tend to, uh, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that at all, but it's not, it doesn't feel right to me. I, I generally paint with a slightly more restrained, I suppose you could say, aesthetic. And that's where I wanted this painting to go. I wanted that to come back into it because it really felt like it was starting to lose it. And that it had come out just partly because I had done it kind of on the fly, I suppose. It was just coming out a bit too, for me personally, a little bit too, too bravado and the chroma was too high. So I've gone in, I suppose you could say, I've gone in with like a rush of inspiration on the first session and today I'm kind of uh, pulling it back towards where I would really like it to be. So I've, I've brought down the chroma of the background and I've brought down the value a little bit. I may still bring down the value of this ground more actually than that. But now I'm starting to think about that red on that apple and um, you know, I'm still, I'm thinking about the painting as a whole, really, like what I, what I want from it. And I'm 
The more I bring this value of this down, the more it feels right to me. Do I do portraits, this fan asks. No, but that's funny you should ask because I was just telling that story of when I returned to painting a long time ago and down. My idea then was that I was going to be a portrait painter. And then I started painting still life because it's really manageable, you know, you can, when you're learning, it's like, you know, you can't afford to be paying portrait sitters, um, but flowers and um, bowls and fruit, they will sit for you for as long as they last, you know. Uh, and I really fell in love with still life. So people are a bit snooty about still life sometimes, some people are. I think, it, uh, for me, I think it can be as expressive and meaningful as any other form of painting. Some people see it as a somehow a lower, lower form of painting and I, I couldn't disagree more. I think it can be very beautiful, you know, like people who inspire me, still life painters. Um, for flowers, uh, Kathy Speranza, oh my word. How does she get so much meaning into those paintings? I mean, really, Michael Klein for flowers. Katie Whipple, flowers again, S stunningly beautiful work. You know, I mean, I, for me, I think it's really time we threw out those old, old ideas about what subjects are the most um, important and worthy of the attention of an artist you know it's like you can have it to me anyway you can have a still life painting which moves you deeply and a portrait which leaves you cold or a figure painting or an allegory or whatever that leaves you cold you know it doesn't speak to you still life <clears throat> painters um no longer with us, painters are no longer with us, still life that inspire me. Emil Carlson, Hofschett Pushman. Oh, if I could even get close to the kind of the, the spiritual depth that Hofschett Pushman gets into a still life, I would be a very happy painter. Let me drink some tea before my. I need to, before my. Um, it gets too cold and I can't speak anymore. So this is kind of gives you the long view, you know. Um, I think really, if you look against what I've got here, I think my, my background is still darker here, but simply because I may, I may bring it up a little bit, but simply because something is there doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be here. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, for me, I think it's fine to change something. I, I very rarely paint these days exactly what's in front of me, you know, try to vary it a little bit. Um, tea. So the thing is, this is what you don't see. When I'm, when you, when I'm just, you can just see the painting and the palette. You don't see all the times that I do this. You know, stand right back, squint down, flick my eye from one to the other and decide how I'm doing, if there's anything I want to change. Um, I think the kind of, I'm, I'm happier with it now. I'm definitely happy with it now. Sheila says, please explain warm and cool shadows and warm and cool lights, particularly on a white background. When I tell you what I have to say about warm and cool, I, I personally, I think it's a very confusing concept. It's a confusing way to approach colour and is best avoided. Um, I think of colour in terms of hue, value and chroma. And the reason I think warm and cool is um, it's not nonsense, but it, it's, it can be confusing and complicate the issue and confuse the issue for people is that... Um, Chroma can be, a change in chroma can be a function of either, a, a, a temperature, sorry, could be a function of either the hue, either the hue or of the, um, 
or of the chroma. Let me try and show you something on the palette to, to show you what I mean. Okay, so let's say I have um, a high chroma orange. I mean, you would pretty much say that's a warm color, wouldn't you? You know, very warm. And it's, it's a, a Get a bit more yellow into it. It's, it's like it's a red orange I've got there. A reddish orange, okay. So if I took, say, raw umber, which is a yellow orange, put in a, a little bit of, swing it towards red, so I'll use the quinacridone rose. So this is now, this also is, once a little bit more pushing towards yellow, but I'm being careful not to put too much chroma into it. bring up the value so it's about the same value with white which will drop the chroma again a little bit. See these are both red oranges right? Both these colors are red oranges but you would say that one is cool compared to that one right? But they're roughly the same hue. They're roughly the same hue. If I had, <clears throat> so that's a change in chroma. So you could call it temperature but it's it's a change in chroma and a chroma is the intensity of the color. They're, in terms of hue, they're pretty much the same. They're both red oranges. Yes, CW, if you look on my Facebook profile, um, I know you're on YouTube. Oh no, actually you can pop back to YouTube, to my channel, all the streams are recorded there. Let's get this right. So this is, um, this is ultramarine blue, right? I bring this up to about the same value. <clears throat> Now you would say that uh, in terms of temperature, I don't think anyone would argue, you'd say this is, is cooler than both of those. But this here is, um, let's get a neutral. So this is ivory black with a tiny amount of raw umber to swing it neutral. get them to the same value. Got a bit of blue in it, but never mind. So if you were to look at these two colors side by side, and this is close to neutral, you would say that this one is warmer than that one, right? But they're the same hue. They're the same hue. So <clears throat> sometimes a difference in warm and, and cool is not just a difference in whether it's more orange or more blue. It can be exactly the same hue and it can be a change in chroma, okay? And I think what confuses people a lot is they're never really sure when they look at something, whether it's one or the other. And quite often, if you look at a painter who controls what you would call temperature, say in skin tones incredibly well, like say Bouguereau, when he's moving, I think anyway, from what I've seen, I've never seen one of his paintings in the flesh, but when, when he's moving from the light towards the half tone in the shadow, he's changing the chroma and the hue, but mostly the chroma. And then people try to cool down a color, they want it to be more cool. They see that happening, they, they call it temperature and they try to cool it down with the blue and you get some very weird results. And I personally, I find that thinking about colour in terms of hue, value and chroma makes it easier to understand and control. No, no, it's fine. I, I'm not in the least offended. Please don't. I mean, asking questions is great. Um, <clears throat> um, and I, I'm not in the least offended that you would, you would ask if I do portraits. Not at all. Not at all. How do you spell uh, that last name? Was that Pushman? It could have been Pushman or... Um, who did I talk about? Quite a few people. Uh, I'll list some of the ones that I talked about. There's Kathy's 
Speranza, you probably all know Kathy. Speranza, Katie Whipple, Michael Klein, and Emil Carlson and Hofsep, Hofsep Pushman. <clears throat> I'm not sure which of those it was. I'll just put that because I'm streaming to three different places at the same time. So, uh, yes, the red. The red. Bougaro. Oh yeah, Bougaro. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I, personally, I don't like his work at all, but I mean, it's technically amazing. Um, but I think it belongs to another time and um, you don't get to paint romantic pictures of poor children these days and, and it be anything but offensive. Or, or uh, you know, pictures of naked women being manipulated by men and it be anything less than offensive. I, I, I hate his work. But, uh, well, that's a strong... I don't hate it. That's too strong a word. I dislike his work. I dislike the subject matter. And I, I dislike... I'm aware that it comes from a different time, obviously. Um, I dislike the... I dislike the... Um, the conceptual background, if you like, the social background that it comes from, but technically speaking, you know, amazing. Amazing painter, for sure. But I can't look at his work without seeing those things, you know. I think we need to build a better world and we don't do it by thinking it's romantic to be poor. Because <clears throat> it really isn't. Being poor is a grind and it's horrendous and it cuts down people's opportunities and, you know, those, those children that he had as mod models didn't live those lives. It's, to me, that's wrong. Um, but, you know, if you look at his work from purely a, a technical point of view, then, you know, for figure painters, control and, and naturalism of, of skin tone, colour, uh, probably isn't anybody better. That's my personal opinion. You, of course, are free to disagree vehemently, and I'm sure many people will. I think it's, for me, I mean, you know, it's interesting to look at from the point of view of it's what it says about the social media that he belonged to and uh, the social media of his clients, <clears throat> as it does about, I think he gets lionised purely for his technical ability, especially by um, people who come from the Italian side of things. And But, but uh, for me personally, I don't think you can divorce that from... The social background of the work and I find that pretty disturbing a lot of the time, to be honest. Red now. So this is the pyrrol red. <clears throat> this is wet still. We're gonna go in there with what kind of brush? Um, this is a I don't often pick these up, I'm not sure why I picked this one up. So this is like the pure colour, it's roughly the right hue, it's a slightly blue-red. I want more chroma than I've got. So I'm just going in with this paint without any change at all to get the maximum chrome chroma. There are subtitles on this stream. That's bizarre, really. Uh, so it's trying to, a machine is, is presumably trying to understand what I'm saying. Yeah, hue, <laughs> hue and values becomes human values and chroma becomes trauma. I'm gonna describe it in those terms in future, Linda, I think. Yeah, I, I use Monsol, so um, I paint in terms of human values and trauma, in case you were wondering. <laughs> that's funny so I'm just just where I think it's the right place for that colour I'm just putting it down pure um, the cameras are particularly bad at reds so it's not it's not quite as high chroma in reality as it appears um, on the photo to be honest 
but um, you know, I'm kind of looking at this photo, this this uh, painting, sorry, and I'm thinking like the the main thing that I was I was thinking about is I would pass pass it and try and sneak up on it and have a look at it out the corner of my eye. And I think what I wanted to change, or sometimes just sit and stare at it for a bit, was drop the chroma everywhere else and raise the chroma on the red. Really make the red like the thing. And then what I'll still have to do on it is to complete the leaves. And um, then probably be done. It'll probably be done then. Ah, oh, okay. Thank you. Maximum trauma. <laughs> yeah. A difference in, in temperature is quite often just a difference in trauma. As we all know. So I'm looking for the shadow color. I want a lower value back here as well. Um, <clears throat> so transparent red oxide here is going to let me bring the value down and keep the chroma because there's there going to be quite a lot of chroma, but it's too orange. So I'm using a little bit of this quinacridone rose to, to bring back a little, um, to bring it back towards red a little. You just want the form to turn, you know. Imagine. So I'm painting like, in terms of color mixing, like really freely at the moment. Uh, I, I don't often paint this way, sometimes do. Don't be disappointed if you're used to seeing me monsling. Um, because the same th process is going on in my head as, as when I pre-mix, I'm just doing it as I go along on the fly. So I've got a light and a shadow version of my red. So here it's in the light and here it's in the shadow. So I'm changing from one to the other as I paint this red back to bring in the shadow color here. <clears throat> Just to try and make it clear that I'm turning the form now. I want to mix um, light and the shadow of the, of the green color too. And I think my green in shadow here has gone a little bit too orange here. So I'm going to take that a little bit more green, I think. I'm just checking. I mean, this is just green, gold and yellow ochre. I'm just checking I've got the value about right and uh, it's going to be where I want it to be. Possibly make it a little bit more green. Maybe drop the value slightly. I'll mix up a bit more of this because it's very close to what I want. So what I'm thinking about as I'm mixing these colors, I haven't got any Monsel chips out, but what I'm thinking about is hue, value and chroma and how it changes with the light. Drop chroma, low umber. There's a yellow orange, I'm gonna drop the chroma slightly. And drop the value, which is what I wanna do, drop chroma and value at the same time. So I'm just trying to kind of 
really just sort of refine it a little bit so the form works a little bit better more than anything sorry for my kids messing about in the background homeschooling can be challenging for a painter i'll tell you that for nothing maybe brought the value down a little bit too far there because the local is obviously lighter. That's better. Um, Isfan says, when you started learning Monster with Mr. Parrish, did you mix and chew, for example, a whole 5YR page? And uh, no to the question and no to the assumption. I didn't learn with Graydon. The way I came across um, Monster is... I can't claim that I did. He introduced me to Munsell in a talk that he gave in a workshop that I attended a long time ago. And um, he demonstrated Munsell. And he showed, he, he talked about how he uses it, how he used it. And I was amazed. And... Um, I was struggling very much with colour at the time, didn't really have a handle on it. And um, I spoke to him afterwards in a bar and he said, do you want me to give you some exercises? And I said, yeah. So he said, get 11 cubes and 11 spheres and paint them, each one, each of the months of values and um, and then do paintings of them. So I did, so I got the Monster Student book and I did that work and it's on my blog and uh, it, immediately my understanding and ability with value just, just became so much better. <laughs> and um, I knew that, that I was onto something new there and uh, then eventually I worked with it for another couple of years and then I got the big book and really delved into it. But I, it was mostly through trial and error on my own. Um, but had I not come across Grade, and I was also a member of his, he had a forum at the time called the Rational Painting Forum. We used to talk about uh, Munsell and stuff. And had I not come across him, I would have never have come across Munsell and very likely still be struggling with Connor. So, uh, yeah, it made a huge, huge difference. Um, <clears throat> but I never actually studied with him. I haven't done his workshop. Um, and did I tube that like a whole page of 5YR? No. I I've generally have pre-tubed paints very little because I like to mix them. Um, when I was doing the value studies, I made myself... To begin with, I made myself remix them from scratch every time because I wanted the practice. I wanted to get good at mixing um, and did. So I got to the point where I could knock up a, an accurate value scale very quickly before I bothered tubing it up. And then I tubed it up. Um, but generally I, I mix as I go. I don't, uh, there's a mistake here. I need a light color for the green which is the Aralide yellow. Chroma dropped very slightly with the green gold. And then, um, actually, let's go with the lead white. <clears throat> so I owe um, the fact that I use Munsell at all to grade him. Uh, and also learn sight size from the Bard book. I would say probably, I doubt if there's, although I've never directly studied with Graydon, um, through using Monsell and also through learning sight size from the Barg book, I think he's probably contributed more than anybody else to my learning journey, for which I will always be very grateful. Um, but you should also know that we, we differ on um, some aspects opinions differ on some aspects. He doesn't like some of the stuff that I do, so don't assume that what I do is what he does, because it isn't. 
you know, a couple of people have said they wanted to do my colour course because they couldn't do Graydon's. And I would say, well, if you want to do Graydon's course, then you're really better off doing Graydon's course because I've never done his course. I don't know where mine differs, but I do know that he disagrees with some of the stuff that I do. I'm just not clear what. Um, so you should probably be aware of that. Graydon has um, an encyclopedic knowledge of paints and colour. And is, um, I imagine, probably uh, the world authority on using Munsell in, in um, what could we call it? Uh, certainly in academic painting. I mean, you know, he, he, he does and, and teaches a very specific style of painting, very influenced by um, 19th century academic tradition. Um, I, I personally, for me, I wouldn't put myself in that tradition at all. A bit of white in here. I don't, uh, there's, there's work I like much more. I don't dislike that kind of work, but it doesn't particularly move me either. Classicism doesn't particularly move me. I would probably say I'm closer to being a realist. <clears throat> in, not in, you know, not in, in terms of like French 19th century movements. So the more chroma here where it's in the light. Graydon has always got a lot of flack for, for Munsell and uh, I think eventually it will get to a stage where he, he will get more of the recognition I, I think he deserves for bringing it out. I think he's he, very possibly a genius and it's not a word I use lightly at all. But I think our um, aesthetic approaches are extremely, uh, are, are very different. I would say it's probably the best way to put it. So core shadow, I'm just thinking in terms of, because I, I have painted a lot of spheres when I'm trying to model form, I tend to think in terms of like the main modeling factors, especially if I, if I feel I'm not bringing it out well enough and I want to bring it out more. People talk about, one of the things people talk about you hear a lot is people say, it gets repeated an awful lot without anybody actually bothering to check. One of the things that I learned with very careful checking of colour with Munsell is that people talk about the bump and they say the area of highest chroma is the half tone here. Um, no, not at all, fan. You have nothing to apologise for at all. These are interesting questions. Um, <clears throat> people say that the... the the illustrators call it the bump and they say the area of highest chroma is the half tone. You know, you can check this for yourself. It isn't. The area of highest chroma, given a single local from light to shadow, is the light. Which makes sense, right? Because that's where most of the light is. As the form turns away and there is less light, the chroma drops. But people will, will adamantly tell you that the, 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 about the bump and the highest chroma is in the half tone um, without ever having actually tried to find out for themselves a lot of the time because colour is, is not understood very well in general and I, and I think because it's, it, it's hard, you know, and a lot of people struggle with it, they, um, people are, don't like to feel unsure of themselves. Especially men, I have to say. <laughs> we, we don't like, we're supposed to be, you know, we're, we're culturally conditioned to be um, emphatically sure about everything. That's not the way the world is. It's not the way things are. Uh, and men especially 
have a problem, I think, sometimes without admitting that they don't know everything. <laughs> oh, I'm full of contentious statements today. But you know it's true. Um, <clears throat> Colour can be very difficult because there's a lot of bad advice out there that makes it difficult to understand. Um, it actually isn't anywhere near as difficult, I think, as people think. Um, and um, it's mostly because people have a lot of unhelpful ideas that get repeated without any analysis or, or questioning. Um, and as I say, I think it's because a lot of the time people struggle so much with colour, they want to be sure, they want to find a way. So, you know, people will tell me, the CMYK palette, that's going to solve all your colour problems. I'm sorry, but it isn't. Understanding colour is going to solve all your colour problems. <laughs> no single palette is going to do that for you. There is no magic list of primaries. There are no primaries in paint. There are primaries in light. There are no primaries in paint. Primary, a real primary, a set of primaries would be a set of colors from which you could mix every other color. There is no such set. You might be able to make a nice painting. But that's not the same as saying that you can mix every other color. It's not the same thing. You simply can't. There are whole areas of the colour gamut that you can't reach with pri only with primaries. I think my um, my highlight is in the wrong place, and also it's got sharp edges, and I, the apple is is matte. So it shouldn't have sharp edges. It should have diffused edges, the highlight. Oh, right. So yeah, speaking of color, someone was saying earlier on about the workshop. I've got starting on, um, Next Monday, I'm teaching a six week live online workshop, basically using <clears throat> the same setup. I use the same setup for teaching as I use for streaming live, obviously, you know. Or you can see the palette, you know, we have photo to work from, so we're all working for the same thing. And it's all going to be about um, autumn colour, so painting other apples and quinces and pears from the same orchard that these apples came from. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it's going to be like six live sessions. We're going to do three subjects over uh, two sessions each. Um, Uh, let me I'll, let me find the link to the to the workshop and I'll pop it in the in the chat if anyone's interested. So basically, it's like this, but obviously a lot more structured. When I'm when I'm teaching, it's a lot more focused. Um, oh, so someone uh, just said, oh, let me check. Sorry, I'm trying to do several things at once at the moment. Talk, <laughs> maybe too much. Paint, find the link to the workshop and, and check, check the comments at the same time. What I should really do is one thing at a time. So let me get the link for the workshop first and I'll pop it in the comments. In case you're interested, you can check it out. There's a bit more information about it. There's a little video that I made to explain um, what it's about. And basically we'll, we'll be um, painting subjects like these. Not this one exactly. But subjects like these. <clears throat> um, 
Oh, here it is. I imagine most of you probably know about this already, but I'll pop it in the comments anyway, in case you haven't seen it yet. Christopher, I'll get to your um, question in just a second. I'm just um I'm just finding the link, I won't be a second. Hello Blake, nice to see you. Hey, I hope you're well. Yeah, so that's the link. That's the link to the workshop. I'm just going to find it. I'll put it in the Facebook groups. I'm just looking to um, if I can find it to to put it in the YouTube comments as well, because I actually I stream to two different places on Facebook, like a, my own private group over there and also my profile, and I stream to YouTube all at the same time. And what I use for that, in case you're interested, is a piece of software. It's like an online service called Restream, which work, it works really well if you wanted to try and do anything like that. There's the link, I think. So, um, That's wonderful to hear, Diane, thank you. Yeah, Olio Jal Carol today, yes, for sure. Um, so, Christopher, what did you ask me? The surface that is most perpendicular to the light, I think, has the highest chroma. I may be wrong. No, you are not wrong. You are absolutely right. The more light, the more chroma, which is why chroma drops as you go into the shadow. This idea about the bump, maybe it's an aesthetic thing. The, the area of highest chroma being on the half tones, like around here, it just, it's not, you know, it's in the light. I've tested this so many times um, <clears throat> and it's, it's actually in the light. We're trying to decide. Talking about that, like say, like, you know, this area here, on this apple is kind of looking a little flat. It's all right, you know, I mean, the main apple is this one, this little supporting apple. But if I bring up the chroma here where it's facing the light more, it will turn the form a little better, make it look more three dimensional. You know this, even though your brain knows it, even though you may not be consciously aware of it and, and you will read a picture better, you know. Uh, sometimes unconsciously than you will if you try and think about it too much, I think. Um, <clears throat> my, I think my, my greens of my apple are a little bit more, a little bit, you could say warmer, they're a little bit more towards yellow, but I kind of think I, I like them that way, I'm going to leave them like that. It has a slightly more autumnal feel, I think the painting and the photo. Uh, yeah, I'm... I'm uh, I'm happy with the changes I've made so far today. I seem to be ending up with pretty much what I wanted in terms of this apple is really feels like it's the focus now and, it, and dropping the chroma in the background I think really helped and dropping the value here as well. I think that helped too. The, the difficult thing about the chroma being highest where there is the most light is that as you go up the value range in paint, you actually lose chroma and there's nothing you can do about that. You add white to a color, you lose chroma. So quite often it's a kind of a, it, it really pays to understand values because it's a bit of a, a push and pull, you know, you, you can, if you understand values really well, 
you can change the value balance of the painting to allow yourself to get the most amount of chroma where you want it the most. It can make a big difference, especially when you're painting flowers. Probably fairly happy with the apple. You never know, I might come back and do a little bit more on some parts of it, but I think it's. I need a, some thicker paint over this transition here because there's a line I don't want. It, it, at the moment, it feels like it has quite a nice bulge to it, the apple. So I'm gonna, I'm not gonna mess with it any more than that. Um, I like where the chroma is going in the painting. If anything, it looks slightly higher chroma in the studio here than it does on the screen. Cameras have a real problem with reds. I tend to either overdo them massively or not show them, show them as a wrong hue. As you go up the value range, you will lose chroma. Yeah, let me show you just to make it really, really clear. This is why I love Munsell. <clears throat> All colors, by which I mean hues, reach their highest chroma at a different value. I'm going to show that to you. So if you have, this is a green yellow. Let me show you, I'm going to make the Palette bigger and show you on the palette. Here's a yellow green, reaches its height. This is chroma from near gray to high chroma, and this is value from low value to high value. All of these are the same hue a green yellow. So yellow reaches its highest value right up here, reaches its highest chroma, sorry, right up here in the high values. As you move up, you make it, the only way to make this lighter is to add white and you drop chroma. Okay. <clears throat> so here's a red. This red reaches its highest chroma, low down the value scale, middle to low value. You add white, you lose chroma very quickly. You lose chroma as you go down the values and you lose chroma as you go up the values. But red reaches its highest chroma at a different value than yellow. Yeah. That's the challenge of paint. When you want really high chroma anyway, I mean, you don't always want high chroma. Like here, I want the maximum chroma I can get, but you don't always need that. This fan says so. <coughs> Um, after many weeks of repeating mixing a colour string, say something like 5R24 to 5R84, you were able to get that string perfectly <coughs> without, what does that say? Without the edge of the Montreal chips afterwards. No, I wouldn't say that. I would say that um, I could get very close. <laughs> I could probably get close. Yeah. Um, but it's more a case of doing a lot of mixing, controlling chroma and value and hue separately, very carefully, has built me a kind of um, a, a map, a conceptual map of the colour space 
which I find it a lot easier to navigate now when I'm mixing on the fly. Often, um, it's like anything, you know, when you learn to drive, in the beginning, it seems horrendously difficult, impossible in fact, because there's so much to think about. So you forget to look in your mirror before you brake and you fail your test. You are worrying about whether you're breaking the speed limit or not, because you're having to think consciously about everything at the same time. But before too long, you reach a point where, with driving, where a lot of it becomes automatic. You're so used to it, your brain does that processing a, a, a level of below consciousness. You don't have to consciously think about all of those things anymore. And it becomes much easier and you can focus on just the bits that really matter to keep you alive. If, you, if you've got any sense. <laughs> and, uh, oh, picked up some red in the background. Is that going to be nice or shall I take it out? Leave it. And that's, uh, it's the same with any learning any knowledge and colour is no different. Okay, I'm um, drastically in need of a break because I've had a very busy day playing with tech and it's been very nice to paint. I think I've brought this painting on a little bit further. I want to drop this chroma here a little bit more. I think this has become a little bit too... Um, I think that's probably a little bit too high chroma. And maybe we'll want to, to drop the value too. But I'm, overall, I'm happy where, with where this painting is going. Probably going to work a little bit longer on it today may not go, come back to it until tomorrow because all the bits that I want to resolve are the leaves here and here. I don't think it's going to need an awful lot more before I'm going to say that I'm happy and it's finished. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much everybody for, uh, for joining today. Um, if you're interested, this is the Munsell book. I can hopefully can show you if I can get it into the light. This is a very old version, so this came in like two volumes and inside it has, you know, all the different hues with the values and chromas for each hue. This thing is a map to colour um, <coughs> and uh, with a, if you, if you have a, a good uh, method of mixing that makes sense um, and you can navigate that map, then colour becomes a lot more easy to manage. Um, so I'm yeah, probably going to keep on with this one a little bit more, maybe later on today, maybe tomorrow. Um, the workshop starts on Monday and um, there's a discount on it at the moment. It's $175 for six weeks. Uh, all the videos are downloadable uh, and they're all recorded so you, you get them all forever basically. And the last day, there's a discount of $30, and the last day for the discount is today. So if you want to do it, <laughs> today's the day to sign up. Um, thanks very much for watching, everybody. I hope that was interesting and useful, and I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll see you all again next week for some more streams. Bye for now.